Artie's Place. Martin. Brent. Good to see you. I'm doing a really weird topic tonight. Really weird topic, but I'm going to wait till we get a few people here. Very strange for most of you, but you might find it interesting. Michael Bacchioni, Jason Weems, thank you, sir. <clears throat> good to see you. Truly is good to see you. I'm going to be talking about how to blow up a barbershop, and I'm talking about blow up the business, not blow it up as in bombs. <laughs> I'm talking about blow a business up, and this, of course, can be you could transfer the concepts over to any other retail type of business. I did some consulting exactly 10 years ago. I wrote this up on March 23rd, 2013. Okay, so it's about, about 10 years ago. But I'm going to be sharing some of those findings tonight. I was asked to be a consultant at a chain of barbershops. And guess what? They're no longer here. Because they did not follow through on things. There was a guy I know who was going to uh, purchase a barbershop and then try to start a chain with it. And he says, I just, I want you to come in and study their operations. Just, they, they gave me permission to check the books, their marketing plan, their business plan, blah, blah, blah. I said, I'm, I'd be more than happy to do that. And this was possibly a, uh, going to be a pilot for a TV show. You heard a bar rescue where the dude goes in and just redoes a bar, bar restaurant, because he knew what would make it pop, what would make it profitable. I have been part of some businesses that exploded in growth. I've been part of some businesses that have just absolutely bombed. And I'm bringing some of my expertise. This is from 10 years ago. 10 years ago. When I was 52 years old. I'll be sharing those things in a little bit once we get the numbers up here. I will be keeping this video up. So my thoughts were, you know, let me do this. And then who knows, maybe I'll pitch it to a television network as a kind of a, a bar salon, a place that serves men, a barbershop salon for men kind of makeover show. That That's what was going through my head. It reminded me of tap. Tabitha's, is that her name? Tabitha, yeah. Tabitha's Salon Takeover, where she would go in. And there was a bunch of shows like that, where somebody would actually go into a business, look at what they're doing, look at the employees, look at the books, look at the flow of business, look at their marketing, and be able to say what they're doing right. Wrong. And so I went in with this guy who was an investor and he, he, he had been coming to me. He was a customer for a while. And he said, I've never met anyone who knows the hair industry the way that you do. He said, if I pay you come with me and do an audit of this particular barber shop. And I thought, okay, okay. Now what I scream like John Tapper Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe it all depends how angry they get me, right? Although angry George can't last for more than five minutes. I just don't have that in me, but I'm going to be going through some of that tonight. And if you guys go somewhere and you get your haircut, which you all do, you are going to recommend this video to your barber, to the owner of that barber shop. And if you know of a barbershop that 
is for sale, failing, on its way out, I might be interested in buying it. So keep that in mind. Right in on this issue, but not after I fire up a pipe. Kettle Bear, it's good to see you. Pavo, good to see you. Slick, good to see you. All right. Let's just start. A uh, client of mine had some extra money. And this was crazy. He half million dollars, which he didn't need a half million dollars, but he was looking at a he was looking at a barber shop that was part of a chain, like a franchise. It was a franchise. It wasn't corporately owned, it was privately owned. So here here is the issue. Yes, Brent Nelson, the only problem is barbershop uh, keep records that look like they're losing money whether they are or not. That is a fact. You are right about that. You are right about that. Bill Boyer, good to see you. So I go into this place and it's part of a chain. I'm not going to tell you what the name of it is. Not going to do it. Pamela, good to see you. And I went in as kind of like a consultant slash auditor with the investor. He didn't know jack squat about barbershops, how they should be run. You got to realize I come from the hair industry. My mother and father cut hair. I grew up not, not knowing anything else. At five years old, I was sweeping hair in my basement. Now, that was from my mom working in a salon, my dad working in a barbershop. Now... We also, not unlike every single barber or stylist that I know, has what? A chair in their garage or in their house, in their basement somewhere. So I grew up with a barber chair in the basement next to the oil tank in the basement and the laundry room. There was a dresser in front of it, a mirror on the wall, and a hair dryer. One of them rolling big old hood hair dryers that my mom would, would uh, put on ladies' heads when she would do perms. I remember waking up on Saturday mornings with the smell of perms. If you guys don't know what the smell of the old-fashioned, old-school perms are, are, just trying to think what is the closest thing to that smell. It's like, it's like a cross between ammonia and shit. So just mix some shit in ammonia and then smell it. There you go. That's the smell of an old-school perm. That my whole house smelled like. It was disgusting. That I grew up in since I was like a little boy. So this is what I did when he brought me to this barber shop. Which a chain. A national chain. It was a franchise. So there was a private owner. All right, here we go. I got about 21. I told him declutter the front of the barbershop. The options, uh, put retail displays against the walls, uh, eliminate displays and put a small shelf at each station for visual point of sale purchases, not necessarily at the register. You go to the register in these places and there's the shelf of all your pom maids, your sprays, your creams, your lotions and potions, your shampoos, your conditioners. Each barber needs to be a salesperson. So those sales need to be made while the person's cutting the hair, number one. Now, is that a hardcore sale? No. No. How do you do that? You use the product that you're selling. Use the product. One of the things I do when I cut people's hair is I like to give three different styles. I believe in giving a haircut that you can wear for work, that you can wear for 
formal purposes and then you can w- that you can wear when you're going out. You don't have the same exact way of styling your hair on a Friday or Saturday night that you do while you go to work. Most people don't anyways. You want to look a little cool. You want to look a little seductive. That kind of thing. We just have different ways of doing things, different ways of combing our hair, different products that we use in our hair. Some people like more height, more loft in their hair. Other people like it slicked. Other people like it uh, parted on the side or just swept to the side. Some people like their hair spiked. But all of those products need to be in front of the person or alongside in the chair cutting the hair cutting chair area yeah the advantages of a bald head that's true but then again if i also do head shaves you got to realize that one of one of my skill sets is shaving heads what can i sell to a guy who's getting a head shave moisturizer sunscreen so product can be sold you got to remember that product and service go hand in hand that's absolutely key in the service industry if you're not selling product along with the service you are literally forfeiting 50% of your potential income so smalls at each station or on the barber station in front of you but don't jack up the whole the whole back bar the whole area in front of the person don't get it all cluttered it's not a friggin museum when i look at some barber shops i see all the shit and it's just like a a visual clusterfuck it's like please let me see myself the other thing is this too i'm not a huge fan of mirrors starting here going up it is a fact that when a person sees themselves in a full mirror put the shit on the side all the products on the shelf on the side. When people see themselves in a full-length mirror while they're sitting in it, guess what they do? They sit up straighter. What is the advantage of sitting up straighter? Number one, you get a better haircut. Why? Because you're not slumped in your seat. If I have to do something in front of you, I don't have to lift your chin up like if I'm trimming your beard. When you're sitting up straight, I can just trim your beard easily okay i want that neck straight i want you sitting up high when people see a full length image of themselves they tend to sit up straighter why do people slump because they can't see themselves from here down everybody looks like shit when they're sitting in a soft chair everybody i don't care that's why when i see interviews and people just using the average living room chair they look like shit you sit back like this and you see nothing but a friggin belly you look like shit so they're coming somewhere to look good so i look good here but i look like shit here even fat people look good sitting up straight people have a tendency to sit up straight with a full mirror in front of them let's get real so each station as well as well as the register, the checkout area, is a point of sale. Number two, improve lighting for each station. The hell with the the fluorescent lights in ceiling panels. What's better is track lighting. Like, you could have that, but you also need the track lighting above each person. Think about this. You want the track lighting, not just shining down, coming also coming this way. That's super important. I can't see, I mean, I can't cut what I can't see. That's why when you, when you see in like makeup rooms and green rooms, you know, uh, that are off of a stage or uh, when someone's being interviewed, they're in a green room. Uh, you see a mirror with what? Lights around it to light the subject. How can I cut a shape? How can I modify that which I can't see? 
Now, some people say that the reason for a barber chair spinning is so you don't have to. I say bullshit. I most barber shops you go in. Guess what they do? They turn you around and the mirror is behind you. And then at the last 30 seconds, they spin you around in front of the mirror. That's bullshit. I want to see what the person's doing the whole time. That's what I want to do. When people come to me, because I only cut hair one day a week now, come to me, they are seeing themselves. That chair does not spin. I do the damn spinning. Yeah, but, you know, it's tiring on you. I don't care. I am the moon. I orbit around you the whole time. Because a haircut is what? It's a three-dimensional sculpture. It's what it is. It's not just a picture. When you're looking in a mirror, if I am looking at somebody just in a mirror, all I'm doing is looking at a photograph of them. I want to see them from every damn angle. Now, see the shape of my beard? Let me just kind of... My beard grows a little sideways until it gets a little bit longer. But you can see the outline of my beard, can't you? Why? Contrast. Dark shirt. Now, if I had... Let me find... Do I have something light colored here hold on i have a dirty towel that i wipe up spills with it's got stains on it but i don't care that one's nasty these are nasty but when i go like this guess what the beard disappears doesn't it okay when i go like this whoa all right so when i get people who have a black cape on if they have a dark beard guess what i do i go can you lift up your chin for a minute and the dark beard the contrast is magnificent if i have guys with a white beard and i ended up by default not necessarily by design being the guy that cuts a lot of hair of uh and trims beards uh of guys who have white beards so i take a black towel or another hair cutting cape and i put it let me just find a clean spot on this and i put it underneath and let me just find here here's here's something dark, dark. let's just say okay this is just a, a blue blanket wool blanket that i use in the winter time here when i put it underneath the beard you can see it perfectly i go turn to the left a little bit they turn to the left turn to the right a little bit they turn to the right and i get a chance to see the sculpture that i just made so keep the customer in front of the mirror seeing what you have a magnificent craft allow them to see it so they can't see it if it's not lit up well. So improve the lighting at each station. Now, this was a franchise. If I said the name of the franchise, it's a barbershop franchise for men. I don't want to give too much information. I don't want to insult the corporate entity. Maybe they'll watch this. But it was all women working there, of course. And they were dressed in a certain type of outfit which was cheesy, stupid It for any creativity, whatever. I just, I, I don't like, I'm not a huge fan of uniforms. I know some places have like referee outfits on. This place had a whole different thing going on and I, I didn't like it. But you can't cut, you can't sculpt, you can't shape what you can't see. Number three. Install sound deadening materials as ambient sound is loud and echoey. When all the chairs are filled and people are talking, clippers are on, blow dryers are going, it's unpleasant. Sounds like you're at a fucking airport on the runway. It's just nasty. I, I have said this for years in one of the places I used to work for. Base. And they say, like one of my clients said, yeah, coming to you is like taking a break from the outside world. And that became one of the slogans of the place where I used to work. Take a break from the outside world. That's what I want it to be like. I don't want them to, 
leave a home full of screaming kids or leave a, a place of, you know, that's crazy with phones going off and just the hustle bustle. When you come and get your hair cut, people want to relax. People want to get an experience. A friend of mine, some of you know who I'm talking about. When I met him, he was getting $600 a haircut. Then he changed his prices to $1,200 a haircut. Now, oh my Lord, I think he's over two grand a haircut. I'm not kidding you. Two grand a haircut. He cuts the hair of Hollywood people. He moved from New York to the Hollywood area and cuts the hair of like Angelina Jolie and like, like A-list people who come they come to him for privacy they come to him for peace they don't come to him for any bullshit and his exact words to me and he was a follower of mine on on instagram and of course i'm very recognizable with the beard when it was even longer very recognizable i couldn't hide myself i literally literally could not go anywhere in the world without someone recognizing me i was at the new york hair show and i didn't know only at this time new york hair show biggest hair show in the world other than probably milan and paris are, are the other two big hair capitals of the world i'm at the new york hair show and i watched him speak and then he was doing a q a Okay, he, he, he came off the stage and had a QA. and a And people were coming up to the microphone and asking a question. And I, I thought to myself, there's, there is no way. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stand in that line for an hour to go up and ask a question. So I started just walking out. And over the microphone, the loudspeakers, I hear, George Bruno, you better not walk out of here. This was in a, a convention hall, huge convention hall, minimum 3,000 seats, huge, huge, huge. You better not leave. He says, get up here. I go up there. Everybody, this is George Bruno, like that. I get applause, whatever. How you doing, George? I said, I'm doing good. So you just gave a great talk back there. It was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And it's really nice to meet you in person. And he goes, he goes, it's really nice to meet you in person, my man. And I'm like, thanks. Appreciate that. And he goes, can we get a picture? He said that to me. Can we get a picture? I said, sure. And he held out his camera, did a selfie with me and him. That was interesting. But some of the things that I was teaching, he was doing himself he was kind of adopting some of those things but one of the things that he taught was this he said people don't come to you for a haircut they come to you for an experience he said his exact words you can go anywhere for a haircut and that blew me away that blew me away you can go anywhere for a haircut and i thought to myself i that is when i started thinking about raising my prices and such i have to i have to say this that the people that come to me right now and i'm like ultra part-time it's hard to see me not because i'm so busy it's hard to see me because i'm so rare the people that come to see me now pass 50 to 100 barbershops and salons to come see me people have come from 28 states and eight countries to come sit in my chair i stopped counting Literally, just stuck. my goal was like, I want to, I want people to sit in my chair from every state in the country. Okay, I gave up on that. I that was just like all vanity and ego and all that stuff. But I'm just happy. I get people flying in all the time, spending a night at a hotel, Airbnb, coming in, getting a haircut, getting their beard trimmed, and and then wanting to get a picture, and then flying back to California. Happens all the time. The people where I work say holy sh shit like what is it what is it 
And I said, well, I've been doing this a while and they get it. Uh, the one place where I worked, I'll never forget that. A guy pulls up right in front of the barbershop, Lamborghini, Lamborghini. Everything stops. All the barbers and all the clients and all the chairs look out the front of the barbershop. One guy says it must be one of George's clients. It wasn't. He just went to the, the store next door to the barbershop. It was pretty funny. But what a cool, what a cool reputation that I got. Because people would sit in my chair and sit up straight. I greeted them all with a handshake. I actually did things that other people didn't do. And I'm going to share those things with you. So I spent some time at this franchise Salon for Men Barbershop. And this is the results of my consulting. And I'm pulling this out for the first time in 10 fucking years. 10 years. This was literally in a file, this report. When sound deadening materials uh, are used in the construction of a barbershop, you don't get the echo when all the blow dryers and clippers and talking are happening. Uh, people getting personal services will have a more relaxing experience if it's quieter. So I, I'm a big fan of sound deadening panels or you can even buy what looks like art prints like large paintings that are actually panels that absorb the sound for instance why is it when you go and get your hair cut at a barber shop or a salon it's all noisy as a fucking airport and then let's just say you you know let's just say you want to get a manicure i'm not a dude that gets manicures but you know some guys just want to get their nails groomed and whatever or get a like a paraffin dip, that kind of thing, which is, I highly recommend that. Maybe get their, their hands worked on a little bit. I know guys that are uh, laborers, install pools, uh, masons, electricians, and they come and they get their, and they get their hands done. And that's cool. But how come when you get, a, how come when you get a side serve? It's always that area. But when you get your hair cut, it sounds like a fucking airport. My contention is make the whole place quiet. You don't have to make the place sound like Studio 54 with like disco music playing or loud music playing. That To me, that just gets old, especially for the people working there. Because who wants to be around that like all day long? You're not working in a fucking record shop. You're working in a place where people are coming to relax. The most high-paid stylist in the world told me people don't come to you for a haircut. They come to you for an experience. I will never forget that as long as I live. Not long after that, he moved from Manhattan to Hollywood. And he doubled his price. Pretty crazy, isn't it? Now, what did he do? We call them stations, right? The barber station, the salon station. He calls his individual cutting area, not a station, he calls it a cloud. You can go to cloud number two, cloud number three, cloud number four. The receptionist sends you to the cloud. Doesn't that sound better? It just sounds better. And when you're in there, you're kind of surrounded about, like, the wall area comes up doesn't wrap around but halfway around you so what's happening is if you have a confidential conversation with the person who's cutting your hair guess what the person in the next cloud isn't hearing it this guy had it down pat down pat people talk about who are the real psychologists and counselors bartenders and barbers or stylists right the stuff that i hear i hear when people get engaged i hear when people get divorced uh, i hear he gets pregnant i hear when he Boy, i'm the guy that hears it first before anybody so 
create a place that is private or semi-private with sound deadening materials. This place, damn, was like a damn airport. Now, all, all staff have to sell. Everyone has to sell. A $30 haircut becomes a $50 haircut with minimal effort when you upsell a product that you just used on someone's head. And also, you are not just putting stuff in someone's... Actually, I should have like my mannequin head out here to kind of show you, as demonstrate as I'm talking about this. This is what I struck people as I'm doing it. You know why? Because they want to recreate that look. And you know you always look good when you leave a barbershop or a salon. But rarely can you duplicate that look the next day can't do it it's just it but if the person takes the time and teaches you as they're doing it like when i'm applying stuff to someone's hair i say oh remember there's two steps to every time you use product on here there's the application and then styling and they're like oh I, that kind of makes sense so what i do is i put a, like a pomade or a gel or a cream or what in a person's hair and i put it in like this and I go around their head, 360 degrees around their head. And then I take a very, very wide comb, not a narrow tooth comb. I'm talking a wide comb. So something like this. I use this for my... Some of you will already know what I call this comb. Uh, you might remember it from about three or four years ago. I, I gave this comb a name. If you know what this name, the name of this comb is, put it in the chat. Okay. So, and then I just start working on the person's hair. Why? Because, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because a comb like this, just like your average Joe Schmo comb, it's going to tear the hair out. When I use a comb like this, it doesn't tear the hair out. And then the final thing you put through the person's hair is what? Come on, use your head. Actually, don't use your head. Use your hands. It's your fingers. Finger styling a person's hair after you've brushed it, combed it, gives it a more human look. And then I say to them, go ahead, I want you to try that. And then they will go like that, you know? And then they're like, wow, that really does look good. The perfect little helmet head of a haircut doesn't look good. You know why? Here's the average guy. gets He gets his hair combed perfectly, okay? Everything's in place. He w walks in his house. And what does his wife do? She knows he just got back from the barber. She goes up to him and says... Like this. And she puts her finger, you know, puts texture into it, right? Because women tend to like a messier, more texturized look rather than this slicked, kind of like helmet head kind of thing. So the last thing where I take someone out of the chair, clean them off, is I run my fingers through the hair and create little grooves. What does that do? It creates a haircut that has texture and dimension. Remember, a haircut is not a photograph. It's a 3D sculpture. Do I sound like I know what I'm talking about? You're damn right I do. So it's a 3D sculpture that people can duplicate tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. That's They don't have to look good just every six weeks when they come in for a haircut, every four weeks, whatever it is. They can look good tomorrow morning by themselves. And one of the secrets is using your fingers and using the product that you just put in their hair that they're also going to buy for 20 bucks. That's why I say a $30 haircut becomes a $50 haircut. You get me? The best way uh, 
<clears throat> to do that is to use the products on each person, the waxes, pomades, lotions, potions, sprays, shampoos, conditioners. One of the reasons why I like products that have a great natural essential oil fragrance versus a fake fragrance. Like, what the heck is, you know, you look at some shampoos and the fragrance is springtime. What the fuck is springtime? Ocean mist. Like, seriously, what the F is ocean mist it's a fake fragrance that they designed in a damn laboratory somewhere all right so for instance i i like uh pro products that have rosemary mint tea tree oil lavender that kind of thing uh and the sale of product can add another fifty thousand dollars per year for each barber to the shop. Can you imagine each barber generating another $50,000 above and beyond the cost of the haircut? This is something that they weren't doing. Number five, the salon barbershop is like an apartment building with a minimum of six apartments. What do you want if you are an apartment building owner? You want 100% occupancy and 0% vacancy. When a chair is not filled, when there's not an ass in that chair, it's not making money. Staff have to be proactive in order to fill that chair. Each chair should have one to two people per hour and generate a minimum, think about it, let's just say you have a five or six chair shop. Each chair needs to be generating a minimum of $60 to $100 an hour, each chair, for every hour that the damn place is open. This is the minimum earning per chair. Barbershop owners don't think about that. Most barbershop owners, especially just the ones who are just investors who don't cut hair, or if it's the guy who has the last chair, he's not thinking that way. Each chair needs to earn a certain amount, and every person you hire needs to know that right from the get. The minimum earning per chair, per day, per week, per month, per year. Every staff person who has scissors in their hands, sees, needs to see the relationship between the occupancy of that chair, the success of the shop, and the success of their own career. Number six, policy and procedural manuals need to be written and each item numbered. I don't care if it's chapter and verse, but when you encounter it, All right, I'm back. Spotty internet out here in the Van Gogh room. If you can hear me, put a number one in the chat. If, if the audio is fine and you can hear and see me, put number one in the chat or a thumbs up. Please do that. Let me know. Excellent. Good. I'm glad you're here with me now. Let me uh, continue. Number six. So you need to have a policy and procedural manual. If this, then that. Everything. Anticipate every possible issue. Everything from opening, like an opening guide. Let's say one of your employees opens up the shop in the morning before you get there. 
there are certain things they need to do. Number one, turn on the lights, lock the door behind you, go to each station, turn on the lather machines, turn on this or that, uh, put the hot towels in the sink, put the essential oil in, wring them out, roll them up, put them in the towel warmers, uh, turn on the paraffin hand dip, turn on the wax for uh, the, like the hair removal treatments, that type of thing. Have the soft drinks ready if you have a bar, if you have, you know, restock the beer, that kind of thing. If there's uh, towels in the, in the dryer, in the back, or if something needs to go from the washer into the dryer, the opener needs to do that. That's super important to happen. So there needs to be an opening manual. In the same way, there needs to be an operation, a day operations manual, and then there needs to be a closing manual for people who are closing if you are not going to be there. All right. Number seven, the marketing plan must be written, clear, and easily executed daily, weekly, and monthly. One of the things that I did when I've worked in barbershops is this, is that Many times issues weren't addressed until there was an issue. I like the idea of having a morning meeting or, uh, and I think, and I, rather than, because I came from the corporate world as well, and I hated it. We're having a meeting. We're having a morning meeting. I'm like, oh, fuck, another meeting. I like to call it a daily huddle. Everybody comes together if it's more than five minutes. And first of all, no one's sitting down during the huddle. Out of your damn chairs. Oh, yeah. A barber never sits in his own chair because that's his moneymaker. Whenever I see a barber sitting in their own chair, I'm just like, no way, man. You don't sit in your moneymaker. You don't sit in your moneymaker. You don't do it. But I bring people together, five, six people in a circle. And they all, guess what? Have a notebook. They're taking notes. And I called it the morning huddle. And these are the directions for the day. These are our goals for the day. On Mondays, Monday mornings, the huddle is a little bit longer. It might be 10 minutes. These are the goals for the week. And you incentivize people with... Maybe an extra long lunch. You incentivize people with a check, with a gift card, that kind of thing. I'm not really incentive. I don't like incentivizing people with time off as much because time is money in the haircutting industry. If the scissors and clippers ain't moving, then the money ain't moving. So incentivizing no work and no making money as a reward for good behavior is stupid. So I like the idea of gift cards. That's a big deal. I remember number eight, there was a, the website for, the website for this particular barbershop was a porn site. These fools did not jump on the domain quick enough when it opened up guess what somebody bought it and made it into a porn site imagine and this is 10 years ago so remember remember if you open up a barbershop or if you have a barbershop just think about the different things that could be associated with it that could possibly harm your business number nine salons barbershops could be open seven days a week for maximum availability for clientele. For instance, I like there's people that do shift work. People that do shift work. There's cops. There's hospital workers. Is there one night or two nights that you're open super late that you're open till midnight? How's that sound? One of the places I worked, I was there at 5 a.m. You know why? You know who comes in at five o'clock to get their hair cut? Soccer coaches and little league coaches who have to be on the field at 7 a.m. They come in and get their hair cut. So I was serving guys who were kind of like me. I mean, if there was a place that was open around me right now 
that had five o'clock in the morning haircuts, that's what I would schedule. Not your typical Tuesday through Saturday, you know, nine to five kind of thing, nine to six kind of thing. But think about that. Think about the hours that you're open and make it easy for people to do business with you. Number 10, neck strips, neck strips. You know, that little thin paper thing that goes around your neck and then the cape goes around the neck. Use neck strips with every single client. What does that do? Number one, it it's very hygienic. Number two, it's something that helps people uh, keep all the hair from here up and not going down the shirt. I used to brag, I boasted that you can come and get your hair cut by me during lunchtime and go back to work and not be itching all day. Think about it. When you go and get your hair cut, what are you thinking about for the rest of the day? You can't wait to get home and get a shower, right? Because there's all those little pieces of hair that went down your neck. Damn it, if your damn cape was used properly and there was no gaps and a, and a neck strip was used, it would seal that area. And I'm not talking about choking people. Okay. Whenever I put a cape on somebody, I always ask, is that too tight? They're like, no, no, it, it's cool. It's good. I'm like, okay, good. I don't want somebody who's maybe too shy sitting there uncomfortable and I'm cutting off their blood supply. But if it's too loose, hair goes down their neck, down their back, down the front of them, and they're itching all day. So one of the things I did was I boasted about, you can come here on your lunch hour. You can skip out for a haircut during work and go back and it'll be as if you never got your haircut and you're not going to be itching. You're not going to be squirming all day because you can't sit still because there's hair down your back. Is this sounding good to everybody? Does this sound like a reasonable plan? This was the result of my consultation with a national franchise barbershop. A wealthy accountant wanted to buy this barbershop and wanted me to do an audit and consult with them and then report back to him whether it was worth it for him to buy and help him make a reasonable offer. Number 11, hair swept after each client, put in a trash can with a lid, not swept into a pile on the floor, off to the side, or in the back of the shop. The hair is gone. Where I work now, receptionists will come back to me, back to the studio where I cut hair. I have a private studio at a salon. She'll say, your client is here. I'm like, All right, we bugged out for a minute. Now we're back. I go out to the client and say, I'll be with you in just a minute. I'm just sweeping up right now. And they're like, oh, okay, no problem. That lets them know that I'm making the place clean for them. I'm not only sweeping the floor of hair, because a lot of people don't know this, but hair is slippery. Hair, stepping on hair is like stepping on ice. If you step on a, a little clump of hair, that you might not see, it's literally like stepping on ice. You can slip and really hurt yourself. So I make sure that I clean off the hair. What I don't do, let me tell you what I don't do. A lot of people will blow dry, take their blow dryer and, and blow the hair off the chair. I don't do that. I take a whisk broom and sweep it off. You know why? Because the hair doesn't fly out all over the place, get airborne. When you sweep it off, it goes, it drops to the floor where you then can sweep it and then pick it up with a dustpan and put it in the trash in between every client. And then I take a towel. I take a towel that in a little spray bottle and I spray the chair, the arms of the chair, where people are sitting, that kind of thing. I usually have some kind of 
like essential oil diffuser going at the same time as well uh, with some type of nice pleasant smell as well Number 12, chairs should be turned in the direction that the client enters the cutting or grooming area and then turned towards the mirror. So what I don't do is make a person go and go around the chair and sit in front of it. The chair needs to be facing the door. That's why I've always said when you close up a barber shop at night, the, the person closing needs to turn all the chairs towards the door, not towards the mirror. And then you put the cape over the chair that has the logo of the barbershop on the chair. So there is a uniformity and a consistency, and it's neat. And a chair turned towards the entrance door welcomes the customer much better than a chair that is facing the mirror that they have to walk around. Number 13, each client needs to be swept off after. This is what I do. Everybody who comes to me knows that I do this. I go, okay, you're done. I take off, I take off the cape, fold it up, put it to the side. I go, come over here now. You have to tell people what to do. They stand in front of me, and I take the whisk broom. And I take them by the shoulder. I go, turn around like that. I initiate that. Turn around like that. If it needs a blow dryer, then I'm just like blowing any hair off of their shoulders, that kind of thing. If that hair that rolled off the cape goes down to their shoes... I will squat down and with my whisk broom, like wipe off their shoes. I also have a microfiber mitt with a solution, like a shining solution on it. And I put my hand in it. And if they're wearing shiny shoes, which most people don't wear anymore, like your classic dress shoe, I just do a quick buff. Like I wipe it down. Always. I'm not doing a shoe shine, but it's in it, this microfiber uh, mitt is impregnated with a uh, like a almost like a it's not a shining solution it's a it it's uh, it's a and it's not a cleaning solution but it, it adds like a little bit of luster to the shoes and the perceived value of that is incredible you're taking care of the person after and then there are times where if a person comes in with a sport coat on or they come with a suit, I always have a hanger. I take their jacket and I hang it up. When I'm done, I give it back to them. They put it on. You know what I do? Because I'm a fucking man and I like to see men look good. I straighten out the tie, straighten out the lapels. I'm like, you look good, man. I'll walk you out to the reception area. And I walk out to the reception area with them. That's what I do. If you've sat in my chair, you know that's what I do. I also have a lint roller for people who have uh, are wearing something that might be where the, the whisk broom won't take the hair off. I will roll them as well with a lint roller. Just always have that ready to go. Number four or 14. Powder dusted and applied after every cut. I happen to use Clubman powder, which is kind of like the classic barbershop smell. And I use a goat's hair brush. I don't use the horse hair brush. You know, the classic horse hair brush with the long bristles that kind of like is standing up that a lot of barbers use. I don't use that. I use a goat's hair brush and I put a little bit of powder in that. And I just make sure that there's no pieces of hair on them after the haircut and that even includes some of their face the uh you know i get it off their ear i will take their ear and bend it forward and you know take the goat hair brush and get the hair out like that so they can very confidently go back to work without squirming and itching and can't wait to get home and take a shower 
if I give somebody a haircut, they can go out to a club or on a date after. That's how clean I leave people. That's how comfortable I leave people. Number 15. Clean off the client, shoulders, shirt, pants, and shoes. I mentioned that. Number 16, do a proper consult with each client. And this is my teaching on what a consult is. And it might be called, some people will call it a, uh, uh, a consult. I call it a pre-service interview. Bulldog products. I, I've never used bulldog products. I'm not aware of them. But And thank you for the super chat. So your pre-service interview, and this is after spending at least six hours at this barber shop, just observing what was going on. What you don't do, what you don't do is put the cape on the person and say, what do you want? These are the questions that I ask. When was the last time you had a haircut? Why is that important? Because if they say I got it cut six weeks ago, then you can gauge, you know, as a professional in the hair industry, you know that hair grows about a half inch a month. And if you see it's more than a half inch, you can almost gauge how long it is since they've had a haircut. So when was the last time you had a haircut? Next question. How long do you usually wait in between cuts? I know ladies uh, typically will go every six weeks for a cut and color. Men will go maybe once a month for a haircut, maybe every two months, depending on their style, uh, many times five or six weeks. Uh, what is your grooming method? Like, what do you do? Do you comb your hair, brush, or finger style your hair. I ask that. Out. I actually say those words. What is your grooming method? Do you comb, brush, or finger style your hair? What do you do when you get out of the shower after you towel dry your hair? What do you do with your hair? That gives me an idea of what their method is because I want them to reproduce what I am going to do to them. Some guys are just so lazy. They just get out, towel dry their hair, rip out half their hair with a, with a comb, and pray for the best. What I'm trying to do is kind of make myself be a, a second. I, like I want to be eavesdropping on their morning routine. What do you do when you groom yourself? Comb, finger, brush, towel dry, blow dry. What products, if any, do you use in your hair and why? Well, I use my wife's mousse or my wife's hairspray or... You know, a lot of guys do that. They use their wife's product. Guess what? You're a grown man. Have your own fucking product. It's okay. It's not feminine if you have your own damn products. So. Tell me about your shampoo and conditioner. What do you use? That's a question that I ask. What do you use? Here's another one. Do you have any health issues I need to know about? I want to know if a dude has a scar here or a mole here. Or if I cut it too short here, it'll stand out straight. Or the last guy that cut my hair cut it too short. You know what the two biggest complaints are? The two biggest complaints are he cut my hair too short and he didn't listen to a word I said two biggest complaints about barbers imagine that imagine that can you remember your favorite haircut and why is it your favorite haircut why was it your favorite haircut what line of work are you in I will take into consideration what a guy does for a living. Is he wearing a hard hat all day? Is he wearing a baseball cap all day? Is he delivering mail? Is he in an office? Is he wearing like a knit cap all day? What does he do? How does he dress? 
Are you open to new styles and suggestions? Since you are the expert. As we are talking and you're facing the mirror, I am combing, brushing your hair, assessing texture, density, hairline, growth patterns, hair and scalp health, uh, facial shape, skull topography, neck length, identifying cowlicks and swirls, seeing how it lays, etc. And I discuss a plan of action and what I think I want to do. Let's talk about each one of those things. A good haircut is based upon all those factors for men. So I get a guy in the chair. Before I start cutting, this is what I do. I start combing his hair a little bit. Okay. I get a feel for what my hands, comb, clippers, and scissors are going to be in five minutes from now. So not everyone's head shape. His head is shaped the same way. Some people have short necks. Some people have longer necks. Some people have little dips and grooves in their scalp. That's why when some guys say they want to try a baldy, they want to go bald. I say, well, have you ever seen yourself shaved? Have you ever seen yourself? Have you ever shaved your head before? Well, no. And I go, why don't we try a buzz cut first? And I do that because if a guy has never seen what his scalp looks like, what the shape of his skull is, skull topography, it could shock the hell out of him. Some people's heads come to a damn point. Some people's heads have like a peak. It's, they look like a, like a bone mohawk. Some people have like little dips and they shouldn't have their head shaved. A buzz cut might look good. A number one all the way around with a taper in the back will look great versus how do I know? Because I've done this to myself a million times. You guys have seen me with buzz cuts. You've seen me with a shaved head. You, I've had everything. I've had every damn hair and beard style known to man. I've had hair down to here. I've had beards down to here. So I know exactly what I'm talking about here. And I've worked with guys who've had hair down the, down the, the, the middle of their back and beards down to their belt buckle. And I've worked with so many different shapes and styles. And I'm not just talking hundreds. I'm talking thousands, thousands. It's just, it's at the point where it's like second nature. I don't even have to think. I look at a guy and I know exactly what will look good on him based upon neck, neck length, cowlicks in his hair, swirls, Skull topography, the hairline, growth patterns, scalp health, facial shape. Like, for instance, the haircut that I have, I tell my dude exactly what I want. Most people don't know how to ask for a haircut. They don't know what to say. They just kind of leave it up to Joe Schmo to do that. Everything that you see with me, with my beard and with my hair, my decreasing amount of hair, I have less and less hair every year, is based upon my facial shape, the length of my neck, the shape of my skull, the growth patterns I have. I know when I said, if, we, if you cut it too short here, it'll stick out. This hair has to lay down. If this gets, if someone cuts my hair and they buzz up too close, I end up like this, like, alfalfa cowlick sticking out of the side of my head that I have to wait another four to six weeks till it goes down. So you want to be careful with that. That is where the use of product, some guy puts pomade in your hair. If a person uses too much product in your hair, that's because they fucked your head up and they're hiding it with product. Every Even bad haircuts look good when you shit it up with all kinds of shit. If you just slap enough shit on the hair, you can make it look good. I like to say that I give organic haircuts. All I need is a spray bottle, comb, and scissors. That's all I need. I don't even need product. I use product because it enhances the haircut. But if, if your barber or stylist uses too much product, that means they jacked up your hair. Because the next day, your hair is never going to look that good. You're going to be like, oh my God, holy crap. And you're doing stuff with your hair to hide stuff that wasn't blended, something that's too short, something that's uneven.
Then I discuss a plan of action of what I think I want to do. I check with you several times during the haircut. Am I as I'm cutting your hair? You know what I say? I look at you in the mirror and I go, "Are we on target? Are we on target?" Oh yeah, I like what you're doing, man. Okay, good, good. That's what people need to be doing. So in my consulting with this barber shop, I was noticing people going from start to finish without checking to see if they're on target. You decrease the amount of bad Yelp reviews when you check in with the person and you treat them with respect and take everything into consideration. I check in with you several times during the cut to see if we're on track. I actually say that. Are we on track? Is this what you're looking for? Those are the exact words I use. And then at the end, I show you how to get the same exact results and the look when you get back home tomorrow morning. Since many of my clients are people who make a living with their image, an in-depth consult is necessary. This is why I talk with the person before I start cutting, before my scissors even start moving. I'm doing this pre-service interview. And I do that with everybody, whether it's a construction worker, a chef, office worker, everyday citizen. Uh, the next time you see your hair cutter, this is what I want you to do. The next time you see your hair cutter, whoever that is, make take note of how much interest they take in you the questions they ask of you, and how much they listen. The consult or pre-service interview is a dialogue, not a monologue. 17. Measurable social media strategy is absolutely necessary in this day and age. Daily blogging or videos is necessary. Necessary. Facebook, Yelp, Google reviews are, are essential. Quarterly press releases are preferable. All must be measurable. If it can't be measured, and every person who has studied process knows this phrase, you can't manage what you can't measure. Everything has to be measurable. You can't just say, I did a good job. Show me how you did a good job. What do you mean good job? What does good job mean? Number 18, I like the concept of each barber in the shop being a rock star with their own loyal following. You don't want people that are just fans of the barber shop. You want people who are fans of that particular barber and will not let anyone else touch their hair. So if you are a barber shop owner, your job is to turn each of your barbers into a rock star and make sure that they are on social media, make sure that they contribute to social media on a regular basis. Number 19, video somehow, some way has to be introduced as a marketing strategy. And the uses of video are instructional, testimonial, promotional, educational, and humorous. Super important. I worked with a young man who now has a series of eight barbershops. I think when he had four barbershops, I went to see him, visit him as he was closing up. He said to me, George, if it wasn't for you, I would not be here right now. Because I was teaching him the same things that I'm teaching you right now. This is all about blowing up the barbershop, blowing it up. So, like I said, this is a similar to uh, John Tapper, right? John, that's his name, John Tapper, the guy who does uh, Bar Rescue. This is more like Barbershop Rescue. Number 20, I used to teach what I call the Holy Trinity of Beauty and Handsome, which consists of optimal health, appearance of hair, skin, and and smile the holy trinity of handsome is hair skin and smile so why aren't you offering teeth whitening products at the barber shop why aren't you selling that once a month 30 days worth of teeth whitening strips 
Why aren't you selling skincare products, scrubs, moisturizers? You are the capital of handsomeness if you are a barber shop. Remember, the holy trinity of handsome is hair, skin, and smile. You basically take care of people from the neck up. That's your thing. Number 21. Dramatic before and after photos should be posted on all social media outlets. They came in looking like this. They left looking like this. Number 22. Monthly networking nights are invaluable. Always exchange business cards with clients if they have Ask if they have needs because each stylist is a hub of influence and a master networker. So why not host a Chamber of Commerce event once a year at your barbershop? Why not host your own independent networking event once a month? You heard of First Fridays? Let's do a First Monday. Why Monday? Because most barbershops are closed on Mondays. So everybody comes in from 7 to 9 or six to nine, or five to seven. So people come from after work, they get a bite to eat, they meet all the barbers, they're not in a hurry. And all you're doing, and you have maybe a bulletin board with other people's business cards on it, that type of thing. Super important to become part of the community in that way. And finally, number 23, ask each client to do a tweet or a Facebook status, or a check-in while they are in your chair. There's nothing like somebody sitting in your barber chair, holding up their phone, doing a selfie, and then posting it on Twitter or Facebook with you standing behind them. Nothing like that. That will help build your business. And where I'm working now, we have stickers on the corner that I advised that says, check-in while in my chair so people are checking in on facebook and the various social media things what i just shared with you for the past hour and 13 minutes is the result of an audit that i did on a barber shop that did not take my advice i got paid regardless the man was a wealthy accountant who wanted to buy a barber shop thinking that it was going to be a great investment I advised him against it because I gave him this report and I didn't think that the people would do anything. They would, I didn't think they would implement anything. I saw that they were lazy and I said it would be a bad investment. You'd be throwing your money out. And I said, I don't think this barbershop is going anywhere. Ten years later, now I drive by this place every single day. Guess what? It's been a Mexican restaurant for the past eight years. The barbershop went out of business. It is now a Mexican. That space is now a Mexican restaurant. Could I have rescued that barbershop if they implemented any of this? The owner might have had five more of those barbershops. But no. But no. He just wanted to hire girls with cleavage that giggled at your jokes and not implement a single thing. It was it. So there we go. That is my barbershop rescue advice consult with you. If you own a barbershop, if you know somebody who has a barbershop and they need a consult, they want to grow their business. I will share, share this video with them or I will do a, half day or full day consult with them if they have several barber shops that are sucking wind right now i can help them i know what i'm talking about been in the business since i was a little boy mother and father cut hair i cut hair i'm licensed to cut hair in two states and i'm designated as a barber manager in pennsylvania and a master barber in florida so i know a little bit of what i'm talking about and i teach in barber academies all over the country, including Paul Mitchell Academies, which are some of the best in the country. I hope you enjoyed this tonight. Hope you learned something. Uh, 
you might not apply anything because you're not in an industry where you can apply any of this stuff, but at least it was interesting. But I want you, the next time that you get a haircut, I want you to just observe, observe and see if they're doing any, any of the things that I'm talking about. See if the barber or stylist asks you questions. Do they listen to you? Are they selling you product that is good for you? Are they making your, uh, ex are they giving you an experience or just a haircut? Like my friend, Ted Gibson said, the highest paid hairstylist in the world right now. Hey, you know, you had a lot of choices tonight, but you chose to tune into a guy talking about barber shops. And for that, I am thankful. Have a good night.